With renewed energy after the coffee break, we resume today's meeting with the second round table discussion, with, which won't leave us indifferent. Breaking old patterns to find innovative solutions enhancing the balance between culture, tourism and citizenship. Ulf Sontag will be the moderator of this session. He is the head of market research and associate director of the Tourism Research Institute Northern German. Our lecturers will be Mrs. Aino Maria Mietinen, coordinator of the museum card from the Finnish Association of Museums, Mr. Ljubo Nikolic, independent member of the Dubrovnik City Council, Mrs. Camille Rumani, co-founder of Eat With, formerly Visit, Mr. Manfred Schreiber from the German tour operator Studiosus, Mr. Pepe Serra, director of the National Art Museum of Catalonia, and Mr. Terry Stevens, leader of the initiative The International Dynamic Destinations from the University of Swansea. When you're ready. Yes, welcome everybody. You see, I'm in my working mode, so I left my jacket there because it will be a hot discussion, I hope. Uh, we're the ones between you and uh, lunch, uh, so I hope, uh, yeah, I hope you make it. You will stay and not move over there. <laughs> and um, as with the last panel, we start with a nice video now by the Catalan Tourist Board. And I haven't seen it, but I know it's a nice video because it won a golden prize uh, for best uh, video um, during the ITB in Berlin. So first we get inspired by this video and then we will move on. Param 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 para param para da da di da param param para la ra para ra ra la no la param pam pa param pam pa Perdona, eh, ya está. Perdona. Oh, welcome home. Please come in. We turn your sorrows into smoke. My home will always be your home, if it can be someone's. Home.
So if not before, I think now everybody not coming from Catalonia and visiting maybe Barcelona for several times, now he thinks the next time I definitely have to go beyond the city. Um, so I think we now, we now got that feeling. Um, we will, in very few uh, moments, um, talk in this panel um, from a more like case study perspective. So we have a really cool mix of cool people with cool cases, um, how to tackle the challenges in this triangle of uh, tourism, culture, and the citizens. Um, but before we dig into that, um, I ask Octavi Bono, please come up to the stage again and explain us a little bit about the context of this video, because then it probably makes it even easier for us to understand about the strategy that's behind and what Catalonia is doing in terms of cultural tourism. Thank you. So Thank you, that's the idea, just to share this uh, good practice because the video is just a part of our strategy when we talk about uh, culture and tourism in 2018. So here we are again. Um, M'agradaria, en aquest cas, com, com comentava, uh, poder compartir um, una bona pràctica, pensàvem que era oportú fer-ho, um, perquè això que acabeu de veure, que alguns sé que ja coneixíeu, um, respon una estratègia més ampla en aquest uh, 2018. Um, en el moment en què des del nostre departament uh, vam conèixer la declaració de l'any europeu uh, de patrimoni cultural, vam prendre la determinació que era una oportunitat que no, no podíem deixar passar, que no podíem perdre i que ens havia de servir per um, donar un impuls especial a alguna cosa que ja veníem fent, que era aquesta associació entre turisme I, i cultura, però que segur que amb aquesta excusa o amb aquesta oportunitat, com dic, adquiria o podia adquirir una dimensió major i més intensa. Volíem, per tant, aprofitar aquest any per, per reivindicar, per posar en valor eh, tot el patrimoni eh, cultural, també el menys conegut. Des d'aquest punt de vista, potser el vídeo, no sé si és eh, un, un exercici eh, amb curós o absolutament curós, perquè algunes icones segueixen uh, apareixent, però en qualsevol cas, no només amb el vídeo, sinó amb el gruix de les accions, uh, per seguir aquest, uh, aquest objectiu de reequilibrar, de, també de millorar els fluxos dels visitants en el territori i no cal dir també aquest seu efecte econòmic. Estem convençuts que el que uh, ens otorgui identitat és el nostre llegat cultural, que inclou, com suposeu, patrimoni material, immaterial, immaterial eh, tradicions, també el nostre caràcter, i posar en valor aquests trets eh, diferencials acaba sent doncs, un, una manera de, de configurar aquesta nostra riquesa. Per això hem de garantir la seva preservació, perquè moltes més generacions de ciutadans i turistes puguin seguir gaudint d'aquest llegat. Per tot això, eh, l'Agència Catalana de Turisme ha fet seva aquesta declaració europea des del punt de vista turístic, declarant el 2018 com l'any del turisme cultural i marcant com a repte, i això és important, posicionar la cultura com un eix clau i diferenciador de la destinació. També insisteixo en el fet que no seria just pensar que hi ha un abans i un després. Hi havia també una especial sensibilitat en aquest camp de fer de la cultura un element central de la nostra promoció turística, però... 2018 ens permetia subratllar-ho. En aquest desafiament, doncs, el, el turisme hi té un paper fonamental, fer valer la cultura i contribuir a la seva sostenibilitat en la, en la vessant més ampla, social i també econòmica. És, doncs, un repte que té un doble sentit, dues direccions. En, el, en, el, en una d'elles, la cultura potencia la singularitat dels atractius turístics eh, culturals i el turisme vella també per la sostenibilitat de la cultura. Dos elements que es poden retroalimentar. Quins són els objectius d'aquest nostre any doncs, del turisme cultural a Catalunya? En primer lloc, vincular d'una forma més directa la cultura com a element distintiu i diferenciador 
de la marca Catalunya. Incrementar, en segon lloc, el volum d'ingressos per turista a partir d'una oferta d'experiències turístiques de més valor afegit. Fomentar la creació d'una oferta de qualitat orientada a una demanda de qualitat i a partir de la transformació dels recursos culturals en recursos turístics més accessibles, més vendibles en el mercat. Fer valer també com a objectiu la riquesa de Catalunya com a destinació de destinacions autònomes, sostenibles i competitives, impulsant, com deia abans, una millor distribució territorial de l'activitat turística. Aquest és un gran repte. Aprofitar l'oportunitat de treballar la desestacionalització, remarcant el valor turístic de la cultura catalana, incrementar el consum d'experiències turístiques culturals dels visitants un cop són a Catalunya i, finalment, també, com a darrer objectiu i no menys important, maximitzar els beneficis que pot generar una cultura que s'aprofita del turisme també pels residents. En el pànel anterior aquest ha estat un aspecte que amb el mateix enfoc s'ha interpretat. Per assolir tots aquests objectius, les accions programades des del Departament al voltant del turisme cultural compten amb una dotació pressupostària significativa, atès que la inversió que perseguim fer per tot això se situa en els 2.800.000 euros. Tant el sector turístic com el sector cultural de Catalunya estem plenament implicats en l'organització i l'execució de les diferents actuacions de l'any del turisme cultural 2018, com us deia, ja siguin les de pròpia creació o implementació, com les propostes que arriben des d'altres departaments de la Generalitat o també de les diputacions provincials que en són socis a l'agència. La nostra ferma voluntat és que aquesta coordinació i entesa entre els dos sectors, cultura i turisme, no quedi només en aquest 2018, sinó que pugui perviure en el temps, vagi més enllà del que és aquest origen, del que és aquesta gènesi d'un any temàtic. Vam seguir una estratègia similar amb el turisme gastronòmic, alguns dels que esteu aquí segurament ho recordeu, amb l'enogastronomia, quan el 2016 aconseguíem la declaració de Catalunya com a regió europea de la gastronomia. I vam aconseguir posicionar els trets diferencials de la gastronomia catalana fonamentada en un trinomi també especial, com era el de cuina, producte i territori, com a eix per garantir la sostenibilitat social i econòmica. Aquest 2018 estem promovent de la mateixa manera el turisme cultural, amb aquella mateixa orientació que us explicava que vam tenir en el 2016 per l'enogastronomia, i estem convençuts que la iniciativa està servint com un cert revulsiu per generar un canvi tant de dinàmica en el sector turístic com en el sector cultural. I allò que més ens plau també a l'agència i a la direcció general és que molts dels que esteu aquí sou socis d'una bona pila d'aquestes accions. Moltes gràcies. Gràcies, Octavi. Crec que... It's now we see it is not only fun to make this video, but this video had a purpose and it fits into a strategy and also it fits into the wider strategy um, that I know <laughs> from listening to next tour um, events all the time that uh, Catalonia is really looking for a new business model of tourism and um, this is, I guess, part of the strategy. Um, I think a lot of uh, buzzwords uh, that we will hear later on were also mentioned here. So it's about balancing the visitors, it's about the cooperation of tourism and culture, um, and uh, find the most sustainable model of, of working. And uh, we have really a cool mix of um, cases here, and I'm really happy we have two players from the cultural side, cultural attractions, cultural um, associations, we have two business models uh, focusing on this, um, on this uh, topic of uh, yeah, bringing people together, the visitors and the residents. Um, we have the local voice uh, from um, Dubrovnik. So what can you do as a citizen if you feel that things are going wrong? Pepe, I, you, you're one of the uh, cultural players, so uh, <laughs> I already talked about you. And we have uh, Terry, who has like a lot of experience working with a lot of destinations where he finds uh, the common things and key factors that uh, in the end you make a destination um, successful. And that's what he's going to talk about. So we start, I think we're almost, and we're exactly sitting in the right order as in the program. So <laughs> it's uh, very good. Um, 
And I know you can uh, tell us a little bit more about um, the Finnish case of your museum association and the new museum card, which I think really stands out. Uh, I mean, there are many cards, but this is a national card for citizens and visitors. And so please tell us more about it. If you like, we have some slides per uh, person. Um, you can stand up if you feel yeah. more comfortable. You can stay sitting, but we will have the slides and there is the clicker. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm very happy to be here in Barcelona and to be able to tell you about Museum Card. My greetings from Finland. So the Museum Card is a 12-month ticket to 250, actually even more nowadays, 260 museums all over Finland, as you can see, see here in the map. Um, it is valid from the first museum visit, so it's not a calendar year, it's when you first visit museum 12 months from that on. And we encourage people to go on a one year long cultural journey around Finland. Physically, the card is a small, bright yellow card, uh, very um, known brand nowadays in Finland. In three years, we have um, uh, managed to become so known that uh, our research says that 71% of Finnish people know this card. Uh, the card costs 68 euros to buy a new card and if you renew the card before it goes unvalid, it's 59 euros, so slightly bit cheaper. Uh, what uh, I like to point out is that most of our customers would not have put 68 euros to museum entrance tickets uh, inside one year, so this is uh, new money coming in to the museum sector. Uh, we also have two other products. This is our main product. We also have two other products that we are piloting at the moment with uh, the organization Visit Finland and Helsinki Marketing, previously known as Visit Helsinki. And these are uh, products directed towards tourists and visitors of Finland. Uh, the products are called uh, Museum We Card, so basically the same card, but it's only valid for a week, but you still get the 250, 260 museums. And the price for this is at the moment 39 euros. And we are piloting it, we are trying to find out what would be the good price for this. Is there, uh, how big is the market for this? Where should we sell this kind of product? Uh, the third product is a museum VIP card. And this is also piloted with coordination with the tourist uh, organizations and also the city of Helsinki. And the museum VIP card is directed uh, to uh, conference visitors. So a conference organizer can order from us uh, as many uh, museum VIP cards as they have visitors. They give the visitors each the museum VIP card and uh, all cards that get activated, we will uh, then invoice from the, from the conference organizer. So this is a way to uh, make the city, now it's been piloted in Helsinki, so the city, Helsinki museums uh, known and easy to approach for the conference visitors. And then we, of course, hope that they will return with their families and on holiday to Helsinki and see, see more of the museums. Yes, so um, Museum Card was started in 2015, launched in May, actually. And here are a couple of numbers. Uh, about the cards. So, so far we have sold 160,000 museum cards. And just to compare, in Finland we have 5.7 million people living there. That's just a number behind this. And uh, this was uh, a great success that even surprised us that we have so fast sold so many of these cards. We're very pleased and happy. Uh, the museum card is a product of Finnish Museums Association, which is uh, soon to be a hundred year old organization uh, that um, represents 300 
and 30 professional museums, professionally kept museums in Finland. So the in initiative came from the museum field itself for the card. Yes, um, since 2015, when the, when the card was launched, there has been a 41% increase in ticket sales in the whole country, museum ticket sales, and also 23% visit increase. Uh, last year, in 2017, uh, we returned 6.2 million euros to museums from museum card revenue. And museum gets a return a certain percentage of their um, adult ticket price per museum card visits. So this is the way that museum gets, gets the money back. And the card is sold in all museums and also in our web shop. So we're really happy about these numbers, big numbers. Uh, it was a su surprise for us that this was such an overnight success in Finland. But uh, I would say that, um, that the change we are most happy about is how Museum Card has changed how people use museums in Finland. We have very satisfied customers. Uh, we have, for example, um, heard that museum card is the best invention since the wheel. <laughs> this is quite nice to hear. <laughs> and uh, yes, it has changed the way people use museums. So with the card, you have bought it once. The people kind of in their mind, they think that the museum's vi visits are then for free for them. They can pop in, they can pop in just to see one of their favorite paintings. They can uh, go every day if they like to the museum. Uh, if they have uh, agreed to meet with, meet with a friend, many people, instead of going for coffee, they now go for a museum. People spend quality time with their families, with their kids. They go to a museum instead of uh, amusement parks. So this is something really, really great, a great great change. It has brought down the threshold to visit a museum and to visit uh, a museum that you wouldn't normally, or exhibition that you wouldn't normally pay for. You're not sure you're, if it's your thing, if you're interested in it. But now you have, have the card, you can just go and look if it's for you. Mm. Yes, and also the museum card kind of opens up the city in a different way. Now, instead of just the shops, you have also other places to spend your time in. Uh, what is interesting is also that in our recent customer survey, 57% uh, of our customers said that they, uh, when, they pl uh, when they travel around in Finland, they now take uh, in consideration where there are museums that they could visit. This didn't, uh, in this scale, this didn't, didn't happen before. And uh, many, like, like I said, many, many of our customers would not have spent 68 euros per year to museums. Many, many of our customers didn't go to museums before buying the card or getting the card as a present for Christmas or from uh, from uh, as a perf birthday present. So um, this also what the card has done is kind of um, made the museum's familiar strength and also the ownership of these museums, which also include historical places like castles, castles and so, so worth, a couple of churches we have as well. And uh, this is kind of to answer the better place to live in the headline of today's today's meeting and yes and and the better place to visit is what we're trying to now uh, think about with this yeah the second round? Oh, sure because okay was, uh, this otherwise would... I run out of questions oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I think then we see first like the um, we see the different <laughs> cases and I would ask everybody really to stick to the five minutes so we um, we Okay. A little, but I know, I mean, it's so interesting, everything, yeah. but we, because we couldn't decide also between the speakers, we have so many here and we would like to hear all of them. So, sure, of course. Um, would be my last thing, but yeah. 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 So we will, we sure. will uh, return to that. Of I think course. we don't need the slides for that. We will do it no, sitting leisurely over here. Yeah. And um, so 
<laughs> if you don't mind, we no, no, continue no. with Lugo. No, <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> okay, it's so it. now it's it's a different story, but also we, we sit uh, in this order for a purpose because you see the variety of uh, different cases and solutions. And Lugo, maybe you can tell about the um, case of Dubrovnik, about where you live, how you came involved in wanting to change the ways things go nowadays. Yes. And where they should go uh, in the future. Uh, well, thanks, Ulf. Thanks for the introduction. I'm very, very pleased to be here in Barcelona and uh, try to share my experiences and to learn from each other about the way how we should uh, deliver, which policies we should deliver to be uh, able to grow livable cities. I will be talking from the standpoint of you, one citizen. I'm living in the historic center of Dubrovnik. I was born there. After finishing school, I went back to, to the city of Dubrovnik, renovated my house, and continued living there with my family. And perhaps most of you have heard of Dubrovnik. A lot of you have been there. How many of you have been in Dubrovnik? Oh, great. Great. And honestly, were your expectations as uh, satisfied when you saw the city? It depends on which time of year it was. Were you satisfied or you were a little bit dissatisfied? I think uh, <laughs> citizens, I, I see according to the answer. Uh, the tourism is the main uh, economic activity in Dubrovnik. And uh, we are, for instance, we, are, uh, we have uh, one million tourists visiting the city uh, with around three million overnight stays. We have huge issues with one million cruise ship passengers arriving per year to the city of Dubrovnik. And uh, uh, we also have a huge number of one-day trippers coming from around other cities uh, in the vicinity of Dubrovnik. As the result of such huge economic growth, uh, 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 thanks to the tourism, the city center has been decreasing its uh, population uh, quite tremendously. For instance, in a 10-year period, we have decreased our population to 42, uh, to 40, we, we witnessed 42 percent of the decrease of the population living with the, within the old city. According to the last census, which took place at the end of 2016, uh, only 1,500 people live in the city. The exact figures are uh, really um, much, uh, much lower. I think it's under 1,000 because a lot of those people at the census, are, uh, which declared them as uh, citizens, are just using their uh, uh, flats uh, for, for renting. They are not living in the, in, in the city. Comparing to the whole tourist sector in the whole city, it is a town of uh, around 40,000 inhabitants and approximately the same number of accommodation units or beds in accommodation units. And we, have, we are witnessing increase in 100% uh, in, in number of beds in the tourist sector over the last 10 years. So, uh, having all those issues uh, uh, in mind, uh, a group of citizens uh, uh, were actively engaged in offering certain solutions. So, comparing to the, to, to the uh, uh, lecture we had heard before by Mr. Vincent, uh, Vincent Nees, I think, from Flanders, we really do have good examples of involving the citizens in resolving those issues. For instance, uh, UNESCO also recognized those issues and uh, set up several guidelines that we should uh, be following in order to make it sustainable. One of them was delivering the city management plan. And uh, the, uh, what I'm very proud of, a lot of citizens living with the historic city were directly involved in gathering suggestions, in uh, making interviews with their neighbors, gathering so much data of what services, what kind of services would they need in order to, to, be, uh, to, be, it, uh, uh, to be it livable. Uh, we also started several initiations, uh, initiatives based on uh, uh, modern technologies in order to satisfy those UNESCO guidelines. For instance, we were uh, instructed to lower, to limit the number of tourists or visitors coming to the historic center to 8,000. So the system of surveillance cameras with the uh, ability to count anonymously people entering and leaving the historic center were installed. The, that system was developed by one local startup company. And uh, also, uh, we also uh, engaged one expert from the field of uh, um, uh, managing data from mobile networks in order to see what are the trends, where the tourists are going, which uh, parts of the city they visit at each time. 
all those data are gathered together and can be used to reroute tourist groups according to the certain uh, time of day or, or a certain situation uh, on, on the field. So those challenges that we are facing it by engaging it and handling it cleverly can be tr tr turned into opportunities if you try to engage uh, young people with, uh, with new innovative solutions and uh, try to deliver something completely new and al also exchange this know-how with the other cities on the Mediterranean and elsewhere who are facing the same problems. So, as uh, to finish this, this first, uh, first introductory, I would just say that uh, uh, how we as a citizens see that uh, uh, this puzzle uh, and the way of resolving it. We really do see uh, UNESCO guidelines and all those uh, advice, advices that uh, were raised by UNESCO as a good examples of, uh, if you are d defining some, something that it's called universal outstanding value, you also must raise awareness amongst uh, citizens how to uh, deliver universal outstanding care and universal uh, outstanding awareness. That is what, are, what we are doing on the field and thus pushing the local government and the politicians to deliver policies which will enable Dubrovnik to stay, to stay deliverable and a city will not, will not dying out. And that can foster around sustainable, sustainable growth by engaging uh, uh, players from the tourist sector, players from the IT, players from the agriculture, etc. Uh, at the end, I think uh, the formula that or the uh, that we must um, uh, admit to and the compromise that we have to stay is uh, that uh, uh, rather than one plus one is three, I think in order to keep it sustainable, we must admit that one plus one is more closer to one. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're learning new mathematics here <laughs> at school. <laughs> so, thing is, with your opening statements, you already answer all my questions, so it doesn't matter if you have like one minute more or so, maybe. But now I really, I'm looking forward to the next two ones as well, and it's good they're sitting next to each other because I think the core of your business model, the idea, is really uh, very similar. But um, maybe Camille, you start uh, with eat with, I'm still knowing it's yeah. with eat, and uh, tell where it comes from, what it is, how it has developed uh, rapidly in the past years, and then I'm sure we see the link to what uh, Studiosis does afterwards. Sure. Hi, everybody. So I'm Camille Romani, the co-founder of Eatwiz. I'm super honored to be here again. Thanks a lot for your next to next door and Mr. Terence for the invitation. It's very important for small companies and startups like us to be part of the discussions with institutions and with other players, all the stakeholders of the tourism industry. So what we do exactly at Eatwiz, formerly Visit, we bring people together around food. Um, we actually connect travelers and locals around food experiences. So it could be a dinner, a cooking class, a market tour, any, any type of experiences related to food. And actually, I got the idea when I was living in China after my, my business school, because I was working in a Chinese company and I had Chinese friends who invited me over for dinner for Chinese New Year, for example, and other special occasions. And I realized that I've been learning Chinese for 12 years before that, but it was actually the first time that I'd experienced the Chinese culture from the inside. I was around a table surrounded by, by very warm people and I was able to ask all the questions that I got about all the food that I had in front of me and what's his name and how do you cook this and everything. And I felt so comfortable. And I knew that when I will come back to France 10 years in 20 years from from now, what I will remember from China, it's of course the amazing landscape, the monuments and everything, but it's the people I met. And the value for me, it's in that social experience that we try to create at Visit. So, yeah. So for us, the table is actually the original social network. And it's a perfect place to, to make sure that the social interaction between travelers and local can happen. And when we created the company with my co-founder, we thought we would be the only two crazy travelers that wanted to, <coughs> to connect people around food and everything. So we did actually surveys with representative samples uh, of Chinese people, French, the UK, Germany, and everywhere. And we asked them, would you be willing to book, uh, to book a meal as locals home 
while you travel. And the results were amazing. And for example, 86% of the Chinese. And for every single country, the motivation to do this is very different. For example, food is very important for the American and they want very high quality food when, when they do that kind of experience. But Chinese, they really care about seeing how it is to be in a Parisian apartment, how it looks to how an apartment in Barcelona looks. They want to have this glimpse of, uh, of the insider. And this is, this is really the, the value. And since I came last time, since, I, since well, things have changed a bit, we have been growing. We are working very closely, for example, with Paris uh, Tourism Board and also London and Partners. And they actually help us uh, to grow and they promote us as one, well, I would say, uh, with, with restaurants and other actors of the tourism industry as another, another part of the, of the culture that you need to discover when you go, for example, in Paris and they have journalists or influencers that are coming, they also propose, so one day they will go to a Michelin star amazing restaurant and the, the night after they are going to do an eat with experience. And it's complimentary because people are looking for that nowadays. They want to connect with locals. And since I came back, since I came last time, we are also working with, with OTAs right now, with um, also, um, also TripAdvisor and many, many, traditional actors from the tourism industry. It was very early stage when I was there last time, but now we have been grow growing. And I think it's like everybody knows that that's what travelers are looking for. And we exist only if we have locals that are living in the city center, willing to, to make discover their culture, very proud of their culture. And that Vincent this morning that was talking about the being proud and, and um, the guests that feel very, very privileged to be welcome in, uh, in someone's home. And this is um, the feeling that we want to, to see grow, I would say, and make sure that we have like passionate local hosts that do this for pleasure and to make their culture alive and enable more and more people to, to discover it. Cool. Thank you. You're the first one who made it in the five minutes. That's cool. <laughs> yes, I know. I talk fast. <laughs> So now it's Manfred's turn, because I think it's, it's really uh, pretty close. Same, same, but very different. <laughs> no, the green one. Basically the green one. Yeah. Okay, we are doing, we have, in, indeed, we are very close to, to our concept. We ju just try to bring people together on a much, much bigger scale. So Josus Reisen is a German tour operator uh, with about just a few basic data uh, found in 1954 with the leading German tour operator for cultural tours, Studienreisen as we call it in Germany, uh, more than 100,000 clients per year. That means we are uh, not one of the real big operators, but among the small operators, we are one of the biggest ones. We are active in more than 100 countries, 120 countries in the world, based in Munich. 350 employees and uh, it's still a family-owned company. So what is Studiosus doing? Uh, study tours have been a, a fairly academic matter a couple of decades ago. So it was, uh, the, the content was uh, old culture, was uh, history, art, ar uh, architecture, archaeology and things like that. Uh, we have developed over the years a concept of the modern study tour of course, the cultural heritage in a traditional sense, uh, as I just pointed out, is still the focus of, uh, of such a tour. But with the same right, we try to include modern things like everyday uh, culture, like uh, food, like the political situation, like the whatever. Uh, whatever is, is interesting for the people, whatever people, our clients read in a newspaper at home, they want to have a comment on it. They want to see it when they come to the, to the, uh, to the destination. So uh, we've developed a few things that, uh, with which we try to bring people uh, together uh, in each and every tour. We have an organized meeting with locals. I can pro probably be more spe spe specific about that a little later. But this is uh, one thing that is... Uh, makes a lot of work and it's a sensitive matter to get in, in contact with local, set up the contacts and bring people, as I said, not only once, not only twice, 
but on a larger scale, let's say we have a group series of 20, uh, uh, of 20 people, we have to write in the brochure and on Tuesday morning you will meet this and that person and we have 20 departures per year, something like that. So, I mean, it's a scale that we, uh, that we use and this is a, makes a certain problem, but I think it makes us also unique among uh, many other tour operators in Germany. Thank you. That was even less than five minutes. We're making good time. <laughs> so now it's uh, Pepe. We have another example from the cultural sector, closer by, so here from Barcelona. Thank you. Thank you. So try to be... The green one. The green one. Yeah. Okay. No? Okay, slides are not really needed, but this is not the first one. Okay. <coughs> we try to be very short as possible. Uh, <coughs> Uh, for me, the idea is just uh, two main ideas, and some things have been already said also in the panel before, uh, in this uh, discussion about balancing between locals and citizens and, and tourism and how this can be put together without having tensions and problems and so on, is the idea of the museums or heritage, or if you want, uh, cultural spaces as a great opportunity for that. And <clears throat> what I would like just to explain is how museums more and more has become a place for encounter, a place for debate, for, for a critical thinking. We are not container of things or container of works of art anymore. We don't have a single story anymore. We don't have a, only one public anymore. There's one million of minerals outside. And it's our responsibility to be able to offer a much more open narrative. And more and more, my impression is that Fortunately, we have lost the monopolium on the content. So we are retiring us more and more and being much more a connector than a prescriber. In our museum, all collections now are ordered not chronologically, nor in an academical way, nor for styles, nor for artists, by, by subjects. And this means that departing from maybe a local point of view or a national Catalan point of view, we have a universal mission and we offer things and questions. We put questions on the table that everybody can afford, everybody can be speaking with us or between them. And more and more, I think uh, this is a sample just of a Gothic piece. So it's not a question of ancient or contemporary subjects. These are scratched figures because they were Jewish. And people were scratching them on this piece, which is what, 500, uh, 400 years ago. But this is a present thing and the question about minorities or the question about uh, gender. So, more and more I think uh, museums have an enormous opportunity in this complexity which has become society outside to be a place for meeting between people. Not people with the art, but people meeting inside. It's a public agora, it's a big public square where people can not have find answers but more questions. They can come they, with their own questions and find another one. And in this sense, uh, my impression is that we have to ask very kindly to strategic uh, plans, to touristic uh, sector, to the cities, to the government, to include us as much as possible in the strategic plans from the very beginning. Because my impression is that we could be much more used than now. Of course, if we are able, I insist in finishing of being a kind of uh, repetitive language, academical one, which is, it makes any kind of sense because it's extremely boring, of course. As I'm an art historian, I can say that it's the most dangerous thing, uh, the art history inside the art museums. Museums is about creation, it's about life, it's not about history. Eh? Uh, this is one idea, and I think it's, this is happening more and more. Our museum has 50% of locals, 50% of foreigners, and it's the perfect place for mixing point of views, the perfect place for mixing social structure different is, is the place for democracy, is the place for freedom, finally. I think it's the most free place inside the museum. Everything can happen, everything can be said, and we have to go more and more uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this direction, which we become a universal place. Uh, it doesn't matter where is the museum. The museum talks about the place it is, but from this place we give a vision of the world, and this is a vision open, universal for everybody. This is one idea. And the second one on uprisings is a show we made and generate a lot of debate. Uh, mixing people from 
here that has a local and a very complex situation today. When people from outside would was interested in that, but has his own samples, his own reality, so we can mix these points of view easily inside the museum. This is migration. This is a video on the border with uh, Macedonia. And the second one is just that a sample of that a city like ours, and suppose ours, which is small, it's global, but it's small. They have two rivers, one each inside. We have the sea, we have the mountain. The <coughs> so we have no place to grow. Uh, there's still some areas uh, to be developed. Uh, sorry. Uh, this is a museum in Celine, Berlin, or in Vienna, quarter museums. Uh, this is the Monjuic Hill, which is our modest, tiny hill of Barcelona, which is here behind us. But in this mountain, we have Caixa Forum, we have Mies van der Rohe Pavilion, we have Fundación Miró, we have Ethnological Museum, we have Archaeological Museum, two very important theatres, a lot of free space, a great park, and it's still an underused and underdeveloped part of the city. So in a city like us that has a very areas that the density is extremely hard and it's very difficult to manage, we have still some areas that admit uh, balance but an interesting opportunity to offer a much more bigger space with uh, something really uh, interesting. I mean, not just to move people there with no reason. So it was these two ideas. Yes, Super. That's all. Thank you. Perfect. We will follow up on that. But first we have... <laughs> we have Terry who knows the world. What I'm going to show you next is really, really interesting and very important. <laughs> Over the last 10 years, I have benchmarked 100 destinations from Rotorua, New Zealand, to Franschhoek in South Africa, to Whistler in Canada, to Istria in Croatia. Last year, I put all the results together. And the way this is done in each destination, the destination organization selects 15 people to answer the questionnaire I send them. So this isn't my benchmarking, it's the destinations benchmarking themselves. So last year, I put all of these together. And what do you see? Tell me what you see. It's the same pattern. There can't be a coincidence. These destinations do the same things well, and they all do the same things badly. That's interesting. From South Africa to Denmark. From New Zealand to Canada. They're all doing the same things badly and the same things well. So what are they doing well? Well, they tell me they all do marketing very well. What do they do badly? Management. They don't manage their investments. They don't manage their vision. They don't manage their human resource development. Yet, we're in an era where destination marketing organizations must become destination management organizations. So we see a real need globally for this shift to take place. When you extract why the top of these lists are doing well, two rules emerge. Two rules for successful tourism development emerge. Rule one is you must have great product and great product means good management. Rule two is you never forget rule one. <laughs> it's all about great product. So destination management, creating better places to live, better places to visit, is about delivering, and delivering is about management, delivering distinctive, memorable, relevant to the community, consistent, credible, real, honest, immersive, great experiences. In extracting more information, we've been able to identify this. So on this slide, we've got the stages of critical success 
for those destinations around the world that are doing really well, and then the emergence of a new model, and then I've selected six of those destinations that seem to be doing things really well from the point of view of destination management to meet the new model. So, critical success factors identified in this work, destination management. This picture here of everybody aligned, shared vision, shared trust, shared process, shared outcomes. Always private, public, community collaboration. But interestingly, in the destinations that are doing really well, private sector led. Public sector supported, but private sector led. Most of them not-for-profit companies with community intention. The third point was exceptionally strong leadership. I can tell you with my heart that most of the destinations that are doing well, there's no democracy. <laughs> the leadership emerges as the wise person in the community. It emerges as in Dubrovnik from somebody who's passionate about this working. The fourth item is this idea of co-created experiences, as with you, with e with. It's the local working with the tourist to create the co-created experiences. The next point is this really interesting one. You see the head with the cloth on. The destinations working well invite new voices to the table. The tourism industry is not sufficiently creative to meet the challenge of innovative going forward. So you need new voices. Patrick here once said to me, interesting things happen when you allow different disciplines to collide. So are you willing to allow new voices? That picture is a lady who goes to the destination management organization in Linz and nobody knows who she is. That's interesting. We are not sufficiently creative or innovative to meet the needs of tomorrow's tourism and to achieve this sustainability. But if you get all of that right, we might end up in harmony. This idea of the co-created dance together. So within this, the new model, forget attractions, accessibility, amenities. The new model shouts recognition of each other, relationships with each other, relevance of what you offer to what the tourist believes in, responsibility to each other, and respect for each other. Interesting model. And I then am giving you these six places where I see this new model working really well. They all have a long way to go, but the model is working. First one, Jackson Hole in Wyoming. Please Google the sustainable organization, the sustainable destination. Jackson Hole's DMO has changed its configuration, its governance, and its funding three times in 10 years. And the new model is remarkable. The one below it is Bregenzerwald in Austria, Istria in Croatia, Muskoka in Canada. Have a look at what Ontario is doing and the new ways it's introduced to measure sustainable tourism. Transformational, remarkable, worth reading. Then I go to Linz and its work on the Upper Danube. And finally, and Doug Lansky mentioned it, the Black Forest, this tiny destination of Byersbronn with a budget for managing a village with a population of 6,000 people this year of four and a half million euros. 
That's interesting. And that money is spent on sustainable, co-created experiences. So, some interesting outcomes. Whatever you do, think about that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Terry, I must tell you, you didn't do it in five minutes, <laughs> but I think you, we could stop now because you brought all the conclusions, uh, uh, I think, already there, but still I would go at least with the others another round. It's going to be a little bit a speedy round or maybe two speedy rounds, um, more pinpointing questions, uh, because I think the, the cases are so interesting that we maybe can dig a little bit deeper into. Now I have to look at my notes, what I wanted to ask. Um, when we start again with Aino. Um, what interests me is, um, I mean, you told us the idea came from the association, that it came from within the, um, the cultural sector. Yeah. But I guess still, if you introduce a new model like this, you have to convince the partners, so you have to get a critical mass of uh, museums. Was that uh, a problem? Uh, of course, it took, it took rounds of discussing, yeah. uh, but uh, like I said, the product is museum association's product, and we present 330 professional museums, so it took discussing uh, and took trust, yeah. trust to start this system. We have the trust and respect again with Terry, <laughs> so we see the conclusions are there. And another point is uh, this cooperation with uh, Visit Finland or with the DMO. So you going uh, to the, uh, also how did that start? Did they come to you? Did you come to them? Um, well, the, the mu uh, Museum Association has for longer, before Museum Card, uh, been in contact, or we have been in contact with Visit Finland, and together trying to think how to, uh, how to um, market Finnish museums as a whole and kind of brand Finnish museums. And when the idea of Museum Card uh, came up, this was really the answer, answer for that question, but it has been uh, like even many years before Museum Card. Uh, the cooperation study. Yeah. Oh, cool. Do you already have first figures about the success with the tourists or is that too early? Unfortunately not yet. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you're just starting this the selling and now we have to wait for the yeah. summer season basically to yeah. see if it works. Cool. Um, yeah, Yubo, I think you covered some of my questions or, already, but maybe we can good, dig a little deeper because I think we see also some patterns um, evolve that ICT and maybe new ICT technologies um, are one crucial factor in like finding good solutions um, and you said uh, and, and we, we, we discussed uh, the day before yesterday uh, when, when we had a little bit more time to talk that uh, this this idea of doing the pilots but then also trying to get the the um, the, the local business environment um, to to actually in the end deliver the products of management and measurement can you tell a little bit more about that Yes, the, uh, the idea was uh, uh, to pick up best of the breeds in the industry, best of the industry solutions as some kind of platforms. So, for instance, in order to start uh, doing measurement process and uh, data, uh, big data analysis, you must have uh, some uh, experts already involved. But the specific solutions, for instance, in traffic management or in uh, routing the tourist groups going around the city, can be developed by the local startups. And that was the idea for them, uh, the experts, to deliver the platform and deliver the know-how and uh, the other companies to find uh, business models on top of that platform to deliver specific solutions. And that was uh, very much uh, supported by our uh, local development agency and proved as, uh, as a possible, possible scenario, possible solutions. Because uh, nowadays a lot of young people uh, are moving away from, from Dubrovnik and trying to find uh, uh, career development uh, uh, occasions somewhere else. If you offer them good uh, sandbox, so to say, good uh, cases to develop their solutions on, they could be interested in staying at us, keeping the, the city livable. And one other question more in this, you had a, like you had the or one basis of uh, a lot of the thoughts I think you're having is the UNESCO uh, report and the UNESCO guidelines and also these 8,000 people uh, in the city per day. Yeah. Um, so there is like this regulation approach, but you also have a lot of ideas regarding management. So from the point now, what do you think, what is the way to go both or is there, you need like 
how do you see the regulation and the management part? I, I think the, the regulation should be uh, defined. Yeah. Uh, that the, 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 the specific uh, legal framework has to be delivered, and uh, then specific solutions inside that framework must be must be. Uh, I don't think you can uh, leave it just to the to the free market. Yeah. I think uh, certain regulation has to be delivered, and upon that, specific solutions to be to be uh, developed. And uh, regarding that number of, uh, of for instance, of 8,000, there is also, um, now we are doing just five fighting measures. We are redistributing the crowds to alternative points, but I think the real, uh, real uh, solution is to make uh, uh, advanced decisions by integrating all those data together and doing uh, decisions by the tourists much more before they come to, to the city. And again, we see a lot of things that Terry referred to as because, I mean, you basically did the conclusion already. <laughs> but uh, Camille, um, what, from, from what you told us, uh, what I'm really interested in is you say you're taking the bloggers and the important person to the Michelin star, or they are taken to the Michelin star uh, experience the one night and to the eat with experience the next night. What's the feedback? What do they prefer more? Is there a feedback or feeling? Yeah, of, of course, of course. I think I think it's a it's a question of uh, where, where, fun. When you do an it, you don't do an it with experience because you're hungry. You do an it with yeah. experience because you want to meet locals. So yeah. uh, so um, so just um, it's it's not about it's not about the food that much. Yeah. Of course, it's about like the traditional recipes and stuff. But what really makes the moment unique? It's it's the exchanges and the discussions that you will get. Yeah. So for me, it's 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 just completely different. Like I love restaurants and yeah. I love chef and I'm passionate about food. But it's but it's not about but it's not about that. It's yeah. about sh showing and highlighting um, a different. Um, a different, it's a different way to enter uh, a culture and to discover it from, from the inside. So the, the, both feedback are, are good and, and amazing, but uh, the motivation is not about the food. Yeah. It's really about the experience and meeting locals. Yeah. This is, uh, yeah, the mission of. So uh, because of like it my is. my expectation would be a little bit also seeing Vincent's data mm. from uh, this morning that maybe he goes, yeah, I mean. It's the people that sticks into your head, and maybe yes. you have nice, especially if you're like on a high level uh, consume of uh, nice restaurants. I think it's hard to make an impression there, but with the people on top, maybe mm. you you leave another mark. What he said is that on the one one thousand and seven hundred uh, stories that he got, he got only two times the word food. Only two times the word food was actually yeah. uh, mentioned because because it was more about the people. Mm. Yeah. And mm. another a brief a city, uh, a brief question. Um, with, do you have troubles or you, do you see a pattern like if in those over tourism cities that we have, like Barcelona, like uh, Venice, like maybe Dubrovnik, mm. do you have less hosts or uh, there? Is it harder to find hosts in it's, these cities? It's, it's difficult, for example, it's difficult to find hosts in uh, Barceloneta, for example, yeah. or in the city center or in Le Marais in Paris because there are less and less people living, as yeah, you said, yeah, yeah. in the center of Dubrovnik. And the, the problem is that we have to keep this uh, heritage and cultural way of living yeah. alive. Yeah. So yes, it's definitely difficult. Okay. Cool. Then I go on with Manfred. Um, for you, you told like, it's, it's more this organized way of bringing the people together. Um, and I think the studios, the, the guides, your, the, your guides, they play like a really crucial role. Can you maybe say a little bit like the role of the guides and the role of the like the, the real locals um, for the like the experience of your uh, clients? As you said, uh, the guides are the crucial point of our tours. They can make a tour for an excess. Usually they do, and we train them uh, to organize those those tours, the, the, uh, those meetings with locals. I mean, they are organized uh, before. They get all the information, but when the tour guides go there. They are the kind of interpreters between the, the groups and the, and the host. Yeah? So in some cases, it's a language matter. They are the, not only the, the cultural interpreters, but they are literally the interpreters. The, the local speaks in his own language, and he has to interpret uh, uh, to, the, to the clients, but also culturally. Mm. Yeah. In some, we are world, active worldwide, so in some destinations, you have to explain a lot before, before you go to the home or to a place of a local. For example, in Oriental countries, it's, it's a habit that you take off your shoes. It's very natural. 
in mid Central Europe, this is not not the habit usually. This is something you have to explain uh, to explain before. I mean, just to give you a few examples, what what we are doing, we've developed hundreds of of meetings with locals. Uh, I've been in charge of the Middle East, so I bring it from this part of the world. Uh, in Egypt, uh, we meet in Cairo. We meet with activists of the people who have been involved in the political mm. turmoil in, in to, uh, 2011. Yeah? We go to a, to a cafe in which the activists at that time uh, met and we know some of them. So we invite two or three of them, uh, sit together with a, with a group, have a cup of coffee, have a cup of tea. They explain, they tell a little bit of their, of their story and they are open for the questions of, of, the, of our clients. Yeah. Or uh, in Iran, we, we visit an ayatollah in his own place, a real ayatollah. I mean, nobody has the chance to, to meet him. Same thing, he gives a lecture or tells people about his position very basically, and he's open for, for questioning. Yeah. Just two, two examples. Yeah. Altogether, we have, I don't know, very cool. maybe six or eight hundred different meetings. I would have had two or even more questions for you as well, but I think we're running out of time. Yeah. I want to ask uh, Pepe very briefly um, about the, you said you, you see um, the museums and yourself um, also like in the center as an as a equal partner with the tourism uh, business, with the planning department of the city. Um, is this starting, is this working well or is this um, yeah, I mean, probably all the, all the people are sitting here. I'm not sure if you can speak freely, but... This is not briefly at all. Yeah. No. No. But anyway, no, this is an issue we have been talking in this city and this country for, for, for years. Yeah. But not only here. We have not been able to make it really happen. Yeah. Um, maybe now we are close to it. But uh, uh, I think it depends on the cities, but in Barcelona especially, and I think Catalonia also, it's... It's mainly cultural, and it's mainly the, the main attraction of this city next to maybe gastronomy. And of course, we have a good climate, but finally, it's cultural. So uh, maybe because the success of the city was so fast and maybe not so expected, so uh, we had a great success and maybe nobody was ready to manage this success. Yeah. So the cultural sector has not been able, it's a critical also to ourselves, uh, to have uh, powerful position in the strategic decisions. Mm. So, for example, there's a great discussion on the touristic tax. I'm completely convinced we should receive much more from that just to be able to be much more welcoming. Our restaurants, our schedules, whatever. Eh? Uh, so what we are now trying to say, it's not, uh, it's not claiming, it's just saying use us much more. We think we are a, great opportunity for the country, for the city, in terms of solving something which is real, which is the complexity we have outside. Yeah. Uh, in a positive way of looking at yeah. it. It's more or less that. Cool. Thank you very much. And I know I only have one minute left, but still I want to give the last word uh, to Terry. I mean, I think you did all the conclusions, but maybe from the second round you also have something that you observe or that you want to highlight. Well, I mean, the obvious thing to say is that all of these examples are examples of management. You know, they might not call it management, but it is putting together a system which is delivering something at the end which is monitored, and that's management. And I, I am always puzzled why the tourism industry generally is very retarded when it comes to the idea of management. We need to learn from professional soccer. I mean, the football team I support, which is tiny, knows more about me than any tourism business I've ever done business with. <laughs> and they constantly remind me of what I like, what I buy, what food I eat, what food I drink, when I'm going to the next one. We need to learn from other bits of the entertainment sector. Doug Lansky mentioned the theme parks. Absolutely. Can we start growing up, becoming more mature, and taking management seriously in a sophisticated way? Thank you very much. I think for the yeah, rounding up the things, we have the Slido. Will they put it on or how does it work? So we will have it here. So 
develop new cultural products as a way of change tourism, Thanks. residence, consumption yeah. behavior. Yeah. Do you agree or not agree, like with the stars? First, I have to think about this question. <laughs> we have, I think all the others also have to think about the question. <laughs> But it's cool because I think it's hard to answer. Like from my perspective, it's really, and also what we saw, it's, it might influence, and we had the transformational thought earlier today. Um, but I think if you really, I'm not surprised that it's not a, not a full five over here, but that you also see the challenges in, uh, in really, yeah, changing something in the mindset of the visitors and of the residents. So maybe we go on to the next one. To innovate, we need to go back and connecting people. That's what we talked about. <laughs> That's good. Here, I'm not surprised that, uh, there are, that the answers come easier and that everybody is, uh, is, is going there. I'm not sure if it's going back. I think it was neglected in the past. So it's really, it's the, the going back part of this question, I don't like so much and I, I don't agree so much, but I think it's definitely about connecting people. And I mean, as a business model, but also just to yeah, start talking with each other and in the end, eventually manage uh, the destination in a better way. So excellent question without the back. <laughs> um, next one, do we have three or how many do we have? Yes. Universal topics are the starting point for innovating in attractions attractiveness. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <clears throat> but I'm not sure if everybody understood this question in the same way as I understand it. Because I think that was paper that was you. That was I, that I, I would understand this universal topics rather than putting the innovation and the topics and the attractions in another like in, in a more day-to-day -day context than maybe in an academic historic context but in this answer and this question would say also why right? yeah maybe the question is this maybe if maybe yeah if, if the if the maybe i yeah we don't we don't have to discuss how this question was meant but the way it was posed people disagree so uh, i think it's more complex than that and also when we ask the question we have to make sure we understand the question the same way <laughs> so i think that's also a good thing when we because in the end we saw it's connection it's communication it's cooperation and i often have the feeling that uh, with especially with cultural players and with tourism players you don't speak the same language so before to start you really have to go to the point where you define what you're talking about and really, I know it's a boring exercise because definitions, I think talking about this definitions usually sucks, but it's, it's important. Um, and it's the start. So in that sense, um, yeah, this is, this is a good result. Do we have more? No? Yeah. This is it? Then before I say now it's time for lunch, I say thank you very much to my great panel. I was not disappointed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you. I thought nobody was leaving uh, that direction towards the lunch. So, um, yeah. Now we just meet and mingle. I think everybody stays here so everybody can be approached and asked and discussed. So this should go on and not be the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.